Welcome to the SLA Student Group Talk Series tonight, and thank you for joining us for Tara Murray's presentation on emerging and non-traditional career paths. I'm Grace, I'm the program director of the group, and our talk series features distinguished information professionals who provide insight into the profession, as well as guidance and support to students. And the Special Libraries Association, if you haven't heard of it before, is an international organization that supports the diverse information professional communities. And we encourage you to learn more by participating in our group activities. And if you're not already a member, please email us and sign up. Uh, this is our email address. And tonight's talk will be recorded and available in the next few days on our website. Um, and please feel free to post questions in the chat box during the talk, and Tara will respond um, as they arise. And we will also hold a Q&A at the end if there are any more questions. And at the end, if your schedule allows, please stay for a post-talk chat, mingle and get to know one another. Now we'd like to introduce the chair of the SLA student group, Basha Delasca Elliott. Thank you, Grace. Hello, everybody. Uh, since Grace has introduced me, I'm just going to skip that part. Thank you all for coming to this nice event. And uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Tara Murray, uh, the librarian and director of information services for the American Philatelic Research Library. Uh, the world's premier library for stamp collectors and postal historians, and secretary and past the division cabinet chair for the Special Libraries Association. Tara, who is also the editor of the Specialist uh, column in the Journal of Library Administration, where she discusses issues related to special libraries and special librarianship, has uh, prolific experience in public, academic, and special libraries. Tonight, Tara will discuss emerging and non-traditional career paths for information professionals. Welcome, Tara. Thank you. I'm really happy to be talking to you all, and I'm excited to see so many people here, um, especially because, uh, like Dr. D, I'm on the East Coast, so it's 9 o'clock PM my time. Um, so um, as Bashi has said, um, what I want to talk about this evening um, are some kind of different career directions. I imagine that as students, you're probably all thinking about your job prospects after you earn your degree. Um, I know I was when I was in your shoes. Um, the information profession is evolving, as I'm sure you're aware. And many in the profession, um, as again, I'm sure you're aware, are concerned about a lack of opportunities, and particularly in special libraries. It's true that companies have closed libraries and cut jobs. But I think there are also many exciting new opportunities and new areas for libraries, librarians and information professionals. Um, so this evening, I'm going to talk to you about my own experiences. I've worked in a number of different kinds of libraries, as well as what I've learned through my involvement in professional associations, um, and especially the Special Libraries Association, um, where, as you heard, I'm currently serving as secretary on the board of directors. Um, and feel free, um, I like to keep things informal, so if you have questions or comments as I'm going, um, feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll try to respond as I have time. Um, so don't feel like you have to wait until the end to ask any questions you have. Um, so the, the photo that I chose um, for this slide is a hiking trail near my home in State College, Pennsylvania. Um, it's a trail that I hike just about every week. It's only about two miles from my home. And I, I was thinking about this photo and that every time I go out on this trail, I see something that's new to me. Um, it's not necessarily something new, but you know, I, I pick up on something new. Um, for example, this photo was taken around the same time of year last year, um, and I'm noticing how green that moss is on the side of the trail, and, and you don't see that at other times of the year. It doesn't stand out like that. Um, so I mention that because as you navigate your own career path, um, and for some of you I imagine this may be a, a second career, um, keep your eyes open for new opportunities and remember that the path will likely not be straight nor will it be boring. Uh, so now that you've seen my back out in the woods, I thought I'd show you uh, what my face looks like. The first slide showed me relaxing outside of work. 
Um, this photo was taken outside my office here at the American Philatelic Research Library in Belfont, Pennsylvania, um, which is about 10 miles away from State College. And uh, State College is the home of Penn State University, uh, which was my former employer. This is a job and a place I never would have imagined that I would end up when I started library school, but I absolutely love it. Um, and so I'm excited to talk to you about uh, some of my journey and what some of your journeys might look like this evening. So this slide shows all of the job titles that I've had since I enrolled in library school, um, starting at the top left with my first job that helped get me through library school and uh, down on the bottom right with my current position. When I graduated college, I got a BA in German studies from a small liberal arts college in New York State. Uh, and I thought that I wanted to be a reference librarian at a small liberal arts college in the Northeast. Um, that was my experience, and I liked it. And I had great mentors at the college library um, where I did a work study. And I thought that's exactly what I wanted to do. So I applied to library school, and I got in, and I went through library school. And none of my jobs has been anything like being a reference librarian at a small liberal arts college in the Northeast. Um, but as I said, I, I really couldn't be happier. It's been a great experience so far. Um, and I'm, I'm mid-career, so I hope it will continue to be an exciting ride. Um, so next, I, I thought I would just go through each of these jobs. Um, some of them look fairly traditional, and some of them maybe look a little bit strange. You might be wondering exactly what they mean. Um, so I thought I would just kind of go through each one and tell you a little bit about uh, the job title and the place and kind of what I brought away from it. Um, so that first job, um, librarian secretary, strange combination. Um, this is the job that paid my bills while I earned my MLIS. Um, and it was a strange combination of secretarial and library duties. Um, I think it's fairly obvious from looking at the title how the the company, Chester Engineers, viewed the librarian's role, that they thought it was primarily administrative. Um, and it, for the most part, it was. Um, I was managing a, a small library of um, you know, standards and a, a few reference books um, and some current periodicals um, and a lot of uh, parts catalogs for an environmental engineering company outside of Pittsburgh. Um, but I did learn some valuable things about the role of a library in a corporate environment. I learned that unlike the students and faculty that I dealt with at my college library, busy professionals, uh, which in this case were engineers, architects, and geologists, were looking for concise, actionable, relevant, and current information. I learned that in many cases, my role was not to show them how to find information the way you would in an academic library, but to deliver the exact piece of information they needed to, say, design a door frame to ADA standards or select a valve for a water pipe. The, my experience there um, in my secretarial duties, answering phones and typing reports, has actually proved really useful in all of my subsequent jobs. Um, I can touch type, I think, about 90 words a minute. Um, and I can't imagine if I had to hunt and peck and look at my fingers. Um, I just, you know, I can, I can type just about as fast as I think. Um, and I, I was encouraged to take typing classes in high school by my father, who was actually the only male student in the secretarial typing class in his high school. Um, and he passed that advice down to me that one of the best things I could do in high school was learn how to type. Um, and he wasn't kidding. It's, I think it's been great. <laughs> um, and also, um, answering, answering phones. Um, you know, I was primarily just taking calls and directing them or taking messages. Um, but it really gave me a lot of good experience talking to people and figuring out what they want and, uh, <clears throat> you know, not really doing a reference interview, but kind of, you know, getting that skill and talking to people. Um, I learned that managers remember who raises their hand when a call goes out for help. When um, you know, for example, when we had a, a big proposal or a big report or something that needed to get done and they needed people to come in over the weekend and help put the report together and format it, um, and they would ask for volunteers to come in over the weekend. Didn't get much special for it at the time, um, but when I tried to quit that full-time job uh, so that I could take a full course load and finish my degree, um, my boss 
came back with my resignation letter and offered me a part-time job with benefits, um, which completely flabbergasted me, but uh, really helped me get through library school and keep my health insurance and important things like that. Um, so, you know, I pitched in and I, I found out that they appreciated me in return. I also learned that I really wanted to get my degree and explore other opportunities. Um, this job was a great experience, um, but my first semester working full time and attending classes in the evening, it was very difficult um, and I actually considered dropping out of the program after one semester, which was two classes. Um, it, was, it was a rough adjustment from um, being a, you know, a full time undergraduate with a part-time work-study job to having a, a full-time professional job uh, and trying to go to school in the evening and commuting and all that, um, as I'm sure you guys all know. <laughs> um, but after a semester of working and not taking classes, I realized I really did miss it um, and I was motivated to come back. Um, and by the way, um, I think some of you may know her. My advisor during this time was Sue Allman. Um, and I've always been really grateful that she encouraged me to join the student chapter of SLA. Uh, at the time, I kept saying, you know, I'm not interested in special libraries. I want an academic librarianship. And she said, you know, you're a student. You can do these things really cheaply. Just join the group and check it out. Um, and so when I did end up in a special library, I remembered SLA and I joined. And it's been amazingly helpful to me in my career. Um, so you all are doing the right thing by getting involved. Um, and I also, at that time, subscribed to the uh, SLA Solo Librarians Division discussion list. And I remember many times when members of that group helped me locate a document that I needed for my job. Yeah, I see many of you do know Dr. Allman. That's great. <laughs> Um, so next, after I, um, actually it was while I was still at, at Chester Engineers, um, it was that semester that I was taking a, a full credit load um, and working part time. I also did an internship at Palinet, um, which is a library consortium that is now part of Lyricis. Um, I don't know if, how far Lyricis spreads geographically. It might just be um, in my area of the country. Um, but what I did was I assisted the person who coordinated electronic resource licenses for member libraries. Um, and a lot of what I did really was just maintaining and updating spreadsheets. Um, so it was, again, pretty administrative work. Um, but, you know, I got to sit in the, in the office right next to this woman, listen to all of her phone calls with the um, vendors for databases and electronic journals, um, and then also her conversations with the um, member libraries of Palinet. Um, and I learned that libraries are naturally cooperative and collaborative. Um, you know, if you look back at the history of libraries, um, there are so many of these relationships, even if they're not formal consortia, um, you know, very cooperative relationships. Um, and, you know, librarians are naturally um, people who are attracted to the library profession. Um, you know, I think are just kind of naturally helpful people. They go into that profession because they like to help people, um, whether directly as a public services librarian or behind the scenes as a, a cataloger or technical services or some other role. Um, but I, I watched and saw that libraries really pitch in and help each other. Um, and Grace Kim and I met um, because she's volunteering at, a, at the Western Philatelic Library, um, and I'm involved in um, organizing a group of philatelic librarians, um, which again have been really helpful to each other. And hopefully we're helping Grace in her role at the Western Philatelic Library. Um, I also learned that uh, as I see somebody come in, and electronic resources and licensing are really complicated and they're a lot of work. Um, so, you know, just listening in on all those negotiations and troubleshooting and, you know, there was just a lot going on. Um, and also, I would say spreadsheet, uh, I mentioned typing earlier, spreadsheet skills are important. Um, I use Excel for all kinds of things from um, budgets to, um, we were chatting before the session started about the fact that I'm going to be moving my entire library, um, not single-handedly, of course, this coming spring. Um, so we're using Excel for recording shelf measurements and doing an inventory of our shelving and figuring out which parts of the collections are going to go where. Um, so, you know, anytime you can get experience with um, office software like that, um, I don't think that you will regret it. Um, and even if the, the software ends up changing, you know, 
five, 10, 15 years from now, um, just having those skills and knowing how it works um, and being able to learn software on the job, I think is a really important skill. Um, so then my first professional job, um, it was still a, a part-time job, but I was hired as an evening reference librarian at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Um, it's right in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, so um, you all know the end of the story that I ended up in special libraries. Um, but And a lot of special librarians are solo um, or, you know, the only librarian in the organization. Um, but even when you're not a solo, you end up doing a lot of different aspects of library work, and you're often more isolated from your library colleagues than you are in other library in other kinds of libraries. Um, so even though I haven't specifically been a reference librarian in any job since I left Duquesne, I found the experience working at a busy reference desk and alongside seasoned reference librarians really invaluable. Um, I was also able to assist with and later teach library instruction sessions. And again, even though I haven't been an instruction librarian and don't work in an academic setting, I still find myself doing quite a bit of teaching. Um, and in my current job at the American Philatelic Research Library, I've taught everything from one-hour webinars uh, to week-long courses in library research. Um, so it was really helpful to have some early mentored classroom experience. Um, so I would say if you get a chance to um, to work with somebody doing instruction, um, you know, somebody who's really good at it, um, understands it and has done it before, um, it's really helpful to be able to, to assist um, and maybe jump in and do a little teaching in an environment like that before you have to go out on your own. So then we moved to my first uh, professional full-time job. Um, I had not thought at all about going into public libraries, um, but I was starting to think really hard about getting a uh, full-time salary and benefits. Um, so I ended up as the library director of the Carnegie Library of Homestead, um, which is a very unique public library. Um, it was one of the original Carnegie libraries opened in the Pittsburgh area um, in the late 19th century. And it included a music hall, which has hosted national music acts, musical acts as well as, um, actually during my tenure there, a campaign speech by a presidential candidate, Al Gore. Uh, it also has a gym with a swimming pool. At one point it had a bowling alley, but it was eaten by termites. And in the middle of the building, a uh, library. Um, so it's, it's a really, I, I um, couldn't find a picture in time for this presentation. Um, that was back before everybody was snapping photos on their phones. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a really, really cool building, cool library. Um, kind of a, at least at that time, a, a depressed uh, area it was, um, you know, Carnegie built these libraries, um, you know, kind of to make up for and, and give back to the, uh, um, the communities where his steel mills operated. Um, so after the steel mill left, there wasn't really a whole lot uh, left in the area. Um, but anyway, so I, I landed in this public library and I was, uh, really glad that they took a chance on somebody with little experience. Um, and I, I was really fortunate to work for an experienced executive director, um, not a librarian, um, but somebody who had a lot of experience in the healthcare field, um, and, and really helped me understand the role of the library in the community. Um, though I'm no longer in a typical public library, technically my library is public, we're open to anyone, um, but we're obviously very special. Um, and though I'm no longer in a typical public library, it's really helped me to understand that every library has a community role. And it's, it's helped me to develop the American Philatelic Research Library as a physical and virtual community for stamp collectors. Um, and I see some comments about the Carnegie Library of Homestead history. Um, history of books and libraries, that sounds like a cool course. I would, I'd love to take something like that. Um, I also learned a lot, often the hard way, about being a manager. Um, there was a lot of kind of trial by fire. Uh, I had to do everything from break up fist fights in the youth area to integrating the gym and library staff, um, which was very challenging. Um, there, was, there were a lot of people who had been there a long time and uh, were not happy about changes. I also learned how to say no. Um, and this is something I find, uh, as I said, I think um, 
you know, people who are drawn to this profession are, are drawn to it in part because they enjoy helping people and they enjoy people. Um, and I, I think that, you know, sometimes that means we struggled with saying no. It's um, not something that we're used to. However, we can't be all things to all people. Um, we don't have unlimited resources. We can't clone ourselves. Um, and I remember m my boss in this job used to tell people who complained about noise during after school hours, I'm sorry, but quiet isn't a service we offer at this time. It's much quieter in the mornings and early afternoons. Um, and that always stuck with me because she would just say it very calmly, matter of factly. She didn't, she wasn't apologetic. She just said, you know, this is the, the reality. Um, so I, you know, I joke with my staff now at my current job, you know, somebody complains about something. I say, I'm sorry, that's not something we're offering right now. Um, and, and I find it's actually pretty effective, you know, if people aren't expecting to hear that, they're expecting to hear you, you know, stammer and apologize. And um, so if you just say calmly, sorry, that's not what we're doing, but here's something else we can offer you, or would you like to try this, or, you know. Um, so that's, that's a little um, helpful piece of advice that stuck with me. Um, so I didn't stay too long in this job, um, even though it was full-time and it had benefits. Um, it was a pretty long commute from my apartment, um, and it didn't have great benefits. Um, and I kind of uh, stumbled onto another opportunity um, to work at Penn State. Um, it was my first professional special library job, and I was encouraged to apply for it by a friend who was working as the center's data archivist. Um, and she actually, um, <clears throat> after we worked together, or while we were working together, uh, earned her MLIS um, in an online program through the University of Pittsburgh, um, and is now working as a data librarian at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, <clears throat> but this was back before she was ever considering library school. And um, she passed me this job ad and, you know, said they'd been trying to hire somebody for a while and, you know, they were kind of struggling and she thought that I would be a good fit for it. Um, and I saw this title, Information Core Director, and I read the description and I, I said, I told her, I said, I don't think they're looking for a librarian. You know, this is kind of a strange job and I'm not sure that, you know, I could do this. And she said, no, trust me, they're looking for a librarian. I think you should apply. So I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. I'll put together an application. Um, so I put together the application, and I interviewed and ended up working there for nine years, and it was a really great experience. Um, so you might be wondering what exactly is an information core director. Um, always makes me think of nuclear core. <laughs> um, but it turns out this is a, a term coined by the National Institutes of Health, um, which funds the Population Research Institute at Penn State. Um, and it did include running a small print library. Um, it was a lot of things that, um, you know, people wanted to have close by in the building and a lot of gray literature that didn't end up um, in, the, in the main library collection or was difficult to access there. Um, so we did have a small print library. And I also helped faculty and graduate students affiliated with the center access and use library resources through Penn State's library system. Oh, I see we have a question, what is gray literature? That is a good question. Um, I don't have an exact definition, um, but I would, I would say it's material that's kind of informally published, so it's not books, it's not journals, it's things like um, working papers and reports, um, and a lot of times I think the larger libraries um, struggle with it or don't get it on the shelves very quickly because, um, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to catalog and figure out what to do with, but because we were so small and specialized, um, we were able to get that stuff out there really quickly. And I'm imagining, um, and even during the end of my tenure um, at the Population Research Institute, um, a lot of that stuff was moving to online and was not really being shared in print anymore, um, which I think probably brings a whole new set of challenges. Um, so I imagine that the people working uh, with gray literature now are facing different challenges um, from what I was. Um, I also did literature searches for funded research projects. Uh, I managed restricted data, um, so those were large data sets, and a lot of them, um, because we were in demography, population studies, um, involved human subjects, and so they were restricted, and people had to follow uh, very specific protocols to be able to use the data. 
Um, so we managed contracts and storage and had things in safes and um, set up special closed networks for people to work in. Um, I taught workshops on everything from literature searching to how to put together a poster presentation. Um, and I also worked on identifying funding opportunities for people associated with the center. Um, so what I learned from this position, I learned that researchers were more likely to use information services when I showed an interest um, in their work by attending brown bag lunches and other talks. I was fortunate to have support for attending the Population Association of America meetings, which helped me to learn about demography. Um, and I, this is another thing that I always recommend to people. Um, I, I love library conferences. Um, I always attend the Special Libraries Association conference every year. Um, and I usually also attend the Pennsylvania Library Association conference. Um, and then there's some other conferences that I've attended off and on. Um, I always learn a lot. I come back really excited about my job and my profession. Um, and I meet a lot of interesting people. Um, but I also think it's helpful to go to um, the meetings that your researchers attend. Um, so, you know, when I was in demography, it was helpful to go to um, demography conferences. Um, now, there aren't really uh, philately conferences. Um, but I, I do take advantage of every opportunity I have to go to stamp shows um, and talk to the people who are using my library. Um, and I see somebody uh, just got back from the California Library Association conference. That's great. Um, and yeah, I would definitely encourage you as students to take advantage of any opportunities. Um, most times there's a student rate. Um, you can do things like share hotel rooms um, with fellow students, or if you have friends and family you can stay with, or if it's a local conference and you don't have to travel, um, or maybe you know you can just go for one day instead of the whole conference. But I would I would definitely take advantage of those opportunities. All right, somebody's going to SLA next year. Awesome, uh, right near me in Philly. Um, I also found that um, yeah, Airbnb, another good suggestion. Um, yeah, there are lots of, lots of ways that you can cut down on conference costs. Um, we could probably do a whole session on that. <laughs> you guys could probably give me some ideas. Um, actually, I, I skipped my first bullet point here, um, which is uh, librarians can work outside of libraries. Um, and that's, um, that's one thing that um, I, I'll emphasize a little bit later on. Um, but you know, when I looked at that job description and you know, I looked at the whole thing and I thought, well, this isn't a library job. It's not part of the library. But I realized there are actually um, quite a lot um, in academia and in other places um, examples of librarians working outside of libraries. Um, I discovered that there are a lot of little um, you know, research centers in different areas of the university. Um, where um, you know they employ library skills and librarians, um, but not necessarily as part of the library system. Um, networking. Um, we were just talking about conferences, um, and in, in this job, I found that there's a tightly knit community of population librarians, and they were incredibly helpful to me as I learned about the subject. Um, again, as with my current job, where I didn't know anything about stamp collecting. Um, when I started this job, I really didn't know much at all about demography. Um, so they really helped me learn the subject. Um, and again, attending conferences and talks helped as well. Um, and we all worked together to share resources and ideas. Um, I also, through my local SLA chapter, met many local librarians. Um, and connecting with other librarians at Penn State was especially helpful and led to some really cool collaborative projects. Um, I, I worked with the Social Sciences Library libraries folks to uh, put on some workshops for our graduate students together. Um, and uh, when I left, we were starting to work with the libraries on managing restricted data across the university. Um, and uh, big data and data, data sharing is getting to be really big now. Um, so it was exciting to be in kind of in the beginnings of that. Um, as I mentioned before, I think understanding all aspects of library work is really important for special librarians. And it became apparent to me during this time uh, that I should have, when I was in library school, taken more courses in cataloging. Um, I only took the one required course because I thought, well, I don't want to be a cataloger. I want to be a reference librarian. So I'll just take that one required course, and then I'll take things that are uh, more relevant and interesting 
to me. Um, but I discovered that it would have really helped me to understand um, some of the, the theory and the practice behind cataloging and classification, especially when I was working with things like the gray literature I was talking about earlier, um, that you know I, I couldn't just necessarily go out and steal somebody else's call numbers. I had to come up with my own system. Um, in my current job, I'm really lucky to work with a very experienced cataloger. Um, she's worked at the Library of Congress and Cornell University in their music library. Um, so she's done a lot of a lot of original cataloging and has a really good understanding of it. Um, and I'm I'm lucky that I've been able to learn a lot from her. Um, so I, I would encourage you um, not only to explore areas outside of librarianship, but, but to explore different areas of librarianship. I don't think it ever hurts for a reference librarian to understand what catalogers do, um, or for a cataloger to understand what uh, instruction librarians do. Um, you know, all those parts work together. Um, and when you're in a special library, you often end up doing many of those parts yourself. So um, my current job, um, librarian and director of information services at the American Philatelic Research Library. I love this job. Um, it's not one that I could have even imagined existed when I decided to become a librarian. Um, so I'm glad that I kept an open mind about where I might end up. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, it's the prim premier library for stamp collectors and postal historians in the world. Uh, the collection is very special and unique, which is both interesting and challenging. And though I knew little about postage stamps when I got the job, the experience I've gained in other libraries has helped me succeed. Um, I remember reading the job description and um, you know, I thought, well, I don't know if they'll consider me because I don't know anything about stamp collecting. But I read through the job description and I said, I've, I've done that in other libraries, I've done that in other libraries, I've done that in other libraries. I, can do this job. Um, and luckily for me, what they were really looking for um, was a good experienced librarian. Um, and they have plenty of um, stamp collecting experts on staff already. Um, so they were happy to teach me that part of it. Um, so you know, I mentioned that there are some challenges. Um, and I see Grace just shared a, a link to our library website. Thank you. Um, because most of the journals in stamp collecting have not been indexed or digitized, I've had to dust off my knowledge of print indexes. Um, I don't know if any, if any of you even have experience using uh, print indexes. It was something that I kind of remembered from elementary and middle school. <laughs> um, but we're, we're working on changing that. We're currently recruiting and training a group of volunteer indexers to add to our growing database. And we're working with a software developer and volunteer scanners and indexers to launch a digital archive of the American Philatelist, um, which is the American Philatelic Society's journal that has been published continually since 1887 uh, monthly. So that's, that's going to be a pretty big project. Um, but my, my point with this is that um, your dream job is out there. It just might not be where you think it is. Um, and you may, might have to play a role in creating that job. Um, it might not exist yet. Um, so I think these next couple of slides are pretty fun. Um, Oh, and I should mention that um, my job at the American Philatelic Research Library, um, I actually found out about this job through an SLA uh, chapter event. Um, when we, we used to have a Central Pennsylvania chapter, which has since merged with the Philadelphia chapter. Um, but uh, that chapter did a lot of programs where we would go to uh, different libraries in the area and, and, you know, maybe have a talk, but take a tour of the library and talk to the librarian there. Um, so. One of our tours was to visit the American Philatelic Research Library. Um, and I remember walking in and thinking, this is just the coolest library. They have all these old books. And you know, I never thought about all the different aspects of mail services and stamps. And you know, it touches on economics and history and um, military history and art and design and commerce and all, you know, all kinds of things. Um, but I thought, well, they already have a librarian, so you know. I'll just tuck that away in the back of my brain. Um, and I was actually on vacation in Boston um, and remember seeing the the job come up on an ALA job list. And I thought, well, I have to apply for it. It's um, 
it, at the time I lived half a mile away as it happened. I thought, you know, it's right in my backyard. It's this amazing job. I've got to apply for it. I don't know whether, whether they'll consider me. Um, and it turned out when I applied, they had already started doing interviews, um, but they liked my resume enough to give me a chance, and especially because I was local. Um, so here I am. Um, but now moving on to these slides that I think are a lot of fun. Um, what I did here was I pulled together um, some job titles um, and job locations that I thought were interesting. Um, so um, some of these came from business cards that I've collected at various uh, SLA and other library events. Um, some of them came from job boards that I was looking at, um, and some of them were just um, jobs that I happened to know about. Um, so things like Visual Assets Librarian at World Vision Australia, which is a nonprofit in Australia. Um, I've, I've recently attended some conference presentations on managing vis visual assets um, and how you classify photographs and how that classification might be different depending on um, how you're how you're planning on using them, whether it's a historical collection, a commercial collection, um, but yeah, classifying things that don't have words in them is a very interesting uh, proposition. Um, oh, and I see somebody's going to the Sonoma County Wine Library. Um, I would I would love to to visit that. Um, I know about that one because I I went to a presentation by the librarian there. Um, and I went just because I thought, you know, wine library and who doesn't want to learn about that, right? <laughs> Talk about dream jobs. Um, but, I, but I actually found that a lot of the challenges that he was dealing with in the wine library were very similar um, to some of the challenges that I'm dealing with in the philatelic world. Um, so I actually had a really good time talking to him about indexing projects um, because they have a lot of this, the same thing that they have trade publications that haven't been indexed. Um, and when a journal hasn't been indexed, it's really hard to access uh, the contents. Um, so we have Semester at Sea Librarian. Um, quite a number of universities have that. Um, Research Data and Web Services Librarian at the Institute of Transportation Studies Library, University of Berkeley. Um, maybe some of you have been there. Um, reference librarian at the New York Botanical Garden. Um, and my dad actually um, is a volunteer at the um, Atlanta Botanical Garden uh, working in their library. And I'm discovering that um, he also deals with similar issues with uh, journals that haven't been indexed and things like that. Um, head librarian at the Museum of Flight. Um, Outreach coordinator, library for the blind and physically handicapped. Um, actually, my uh, ex-husband worked at the library for the blind and physical, physically handicapped in Pittsburgh. Um, and it was always really interesting to hear about that. Um, he did a lot of um, reader's advisory services. Um, people would call in and say, you know, I read this and I liked it. And, um, you know, what can you send me next? Um, and also did recordings of books. Uh, that hadn't been commercially recorded. Uh, yes, uh, Museum of Flight, I believe, is in Seattle. Um, manager Research Services and Information Center at the Getty. Uh, librarian at the Nevada Automotive Test Center. Uh, librarian and Archivist, Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago. Um, Associate Director of Library Services, San Diego Zoo Global. Um, that just sounds like a really cool job. Um, so my point with this slide is that there are lots of libraries and library jobs in unexpected places. Um, yeah, I think museum libraries are really interesting. Um, and I actually joined the Museums, Arts, and Humanities Division of SLA be before I was ever really in the field, just because I, I thought the jobs were so interesting. <laughs> um, but now I actually kind of am in a, I'm not in a museum. It's not really an arts job. Um, I don't know the Philly Humanities, but I feel like um, that's one of the areas in SLA where I sort of fit in. I don't really fit in a lot of places because my job is so unique, um, but I'm okay with that. Um, so I did the same thing um, with this slide, um, but here, rather than looking at different kinds of libraries, um, I was looking at interesting job titles. Um, so database manager at Nike Archives, um, assistant director, California Research Bureau, uh, digital asset manager, manager um, I'm probably not ever going to pronounce that right, but that's a cosmetics company, um, director, knowledge center, ASAE, and the Center for Association Leadership, 
uh, Cultural Resources Information Specialist, PennDOT, which is the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. Uh, prospect Development Analyst at the University of Denver. Um, I think this is really a, a growing area for librarians, and we're seeing a lot more of this in SLA, working in uh, fundraising and prospect development, doing research. Uh, knowledge Manager at Spotify. Market Intelligence Lead at Fair Isaac Corporation. Senior Information Analyst, MITRE. Um, and that, that title gets at another thing that I think is really uh, coming out in, in the information profession um, is not just finding information and accessing it, um, but actually doing some analysis. Um, and, and again, I think especially in special libraries um, where people are more interested in getting the information that they need to make decisions rather than learning how to be self-sufficient researchers. Um, strategic intelligence analyst at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. I think that one hits all the uh, power word bingo there. <laughs> uh, manager intelligence and internet, Bennett Jones. Um, idea and knowledge manager at Hallmark Cards. Um, and the last one here, consultants. Um, as I said, you may have to create your dream job. Um, I'm seeing more and more um, information professionals uh, go out on their own, either as a supplementary career, maybe to start, um, or as a, as a full-time career. Um, and I see people going back and forth um, between consulting um, and, and regular employment. Um, and there are a lot of people in uh, SLA, um, ooh, metadata consultant, that's a cool title. Um, so there are a lot of people in SLA um, working as consultants um, with their own businesses. Um, and uh, there's also the Association of Independent Information Professionals, uh, which is mostly library consultants. Um, so here what we're seeing rather than um, different kinds of libraries and libraries in unexpected places um, is applying library skills outside the library um, or kind of non-traditional jobs like data librarian, embedded librarian, um, where you're working as part of a research team, um, but also in, in a more traditional library. Um, I've seen um, over the years quite a few um, books and presentations, the accidental dot, 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 the accidental taxonomist, the accidental systems librarian, the accidental archivist, the accidental data manager. Um, and I have to tell you, I've ended up with quite a few accidental things, um, the accidental medical librarian, absolutely. Um, so yes, we do end up in a lot of these things serendipitously um, and end up learning them on the fly. Um, I've kind of been learning how to, <laughs> to deal with archives and special collections on the fly because that's not something I ever um, dealt with or, or thought that I would deal with, even though I thought it was interesting and took some classes in it when I was in library school. Um, but I've gone back and done some training in archives because it, it really is a different beast um, from the traditional libraries um, or even non-traditional libraries. Um, Oh, cool, somebody took the accidental taxonomist class. Um, yeah, so the, the work, uh, and I was lucky to be able to take some workshops locally um, on on, uh, on archives, um, and that was really helpful to me as I found myself kind of up to my eyeballs in uncatalogued archival collections. Um, but I would argue that um, you can also be purposeful about this. Um, you know, pursue things that you're interested in, even if they're a little bit outside of where you think you might end up. Um, you never know when those skills are going to come in handy. Um, and of course, there are all kinds of things um, that we end up doing um, in our jobs that uh, we didn't learn in library school. <laughs> um, it's very common here. They didn't teach me that in library school. Um, so again, I, I would say take opportunities for learning, uh, workshops, conferences, seminars, uh, volunteer experience, internships, um, get involved in professional associations. Um, professional associations, and I found this to be very true, um, and hopefully you are as well, give you a chance to learn and practice skills outside of the workplace. Um, so it's a little safer, you know, when you feel like your job isn't on the line, your performance review isn't on the line. Um, you're, you know, you're with your peers. It's generally a supportive group. 
um, I like to tell the story about SLA. Um, I, you know, what I've found, and um, maybe you have as well, is that you show up to a chapter event and suddenly you're managing the listserv or volunteering to be secretary or, you know, somebody's asking you to run for the board. Um, and so you get you get involved pretty quickly. I'd always been a, a very shy person. I didn't like talking in front of groups. Um, you made me, I just sweat bullets every time I had to do it. Um, but I kept being nudged a little bit more, um, you know, participate on this committee, be on this board. Um, can you give a welcome at this reception? Um, you know, can you talk to this group about this? And so I was doing a little more and a little more. And um, I was at an event at a, uh, um, you know, the annual SLA conference, and we had a, a big crowded room, and they needed somebody to make an announcement. Um, you know, everybody's having cocktails and talking, and they need somebody to make an announcement. And somebody stuffs a microphone on my face and said, well, Tara, you're really good at public speaking. And I just looked at them, and I thought, I'm the worst public speaker in the world. What are you thinking? And then I realized that, no, I could just take the microphone, and I could talk to these people. Um, and so that was a huge realization for me that, you know, I went from being the kid in elementary school that my teachers wondered if I could actually talk to having somebody say, well, you're good at public speaking. And I thought, oh, that is a skill you can learn. Um, and it's really that I was able to practice it in a safe environment in SLA. Um, and there are all kinds of skills like that. Um, project management, you know, when you're involved in a committee, um, you may get to practice that. Um, supervising, I was, um, and I, I think, again, this is credit to Dr. Allman, um, that she encouraged me to take supervising and, and management classes, even though um, I didn't think that I wanted to be a manager. Um, I ended up in management. Um, that wasn't where I thought I would end up. Um, but as a librarian, you're almost always supervising somebody, um, whether it's volunteers, um, student workers. Um, it's it's a good skill to have um, to be able to to coach and mentor and supervise. Um, budgeting, another thing that I kind of had to be forced to pay attention to in library school um, that I've ended up doing quite a lot of. Um, negotiating, um, data analysis and data management. Um, I don't deal with either of those in my current job, um, but I did a lot when I worked at the Population Research Institute. Um, and I think, you know, those are um, those are areas um, that are not really well defined what the appropriate background is. Um, so you see people who are librarians and people from other fields um, ending up in these roles. And I really think that librarians can play a, a strong role um, in uh, making research data available, um, open, shareable, consistent. Um, we have those skills. Um, construction, something I'm learning about right now is we're building a new library. Um, so all sorts of uh, surprises there. Moving, anybody who's ever moved a library, um, I'm sure could give a whole presentation on moving and all of the unexpected things that happen. Um, and I'm taking full advantage of those as we prepare for our own move. Um, exhibiting, marketing, self-promotion. Um, again, this is something I'm not sure that librarian, most librarians are naturally good at. Um, some are. Um, but it's, you know, you're your own best advocate um, and don't be afraid to go out and market yourself. Um, I mentioned networking, so I thought I'd share a, a fun picture of my uh, SLA Philadelphia chapter group. Um, this was attending a minor league ball game. Um, you can see some people brought their families. Um, but, you know, it's just always good, get, good to get together with uh, your, your colleagues. Um, Nobody can understand what you deal with day to day better than your colleagues. Um, and I always end up getting ideas. And I love hearing about um, all the other cool libraries that people work in. Um, in this photo, I see librarians from the um, Hershey, you know, the chocolate people here in Pennsylvania. Um, they work in the R&D department. I see a couple librarians from the Life Sciences Library at Penn State. Um, I see a librarian for the um, uh, I can't remember what the exact title is, but it's a, a sexual violence prevention center um, and a law librarian. Um, yeah, chocolate research librarian. How cool is that? <laughs> Almost as cool as wine librarian. 
Um, and I would be remiss if, uh, since you all are students and probably are or will be soon uh, looking for jobs, SLA just, uh, I think this week or last week, launched a brand new job board. Um, so this is a screenshot of it. Um, and some of those uh, job titles on my slides I actually got from browsing the job board. There's a lot of cool stuff on here. Um, so definitely go check this out. Um, and another SLA thing that I wanted to bring to your attention um, is this report. Oh, thank you, Grace, for posting the URL. I should have done that. Um, this, and I did include the, the URL on this one. Um, this was a free report. It was con commissioned by um, Financial Times and um, SLA jointly. Uh, came out, I think, last year, um, and I, I wrote about it for my column in uh, Journal of Library Administration. Um, but this says a lot about um, the changing roles of librarians. Um, it's referring specifically to corporate libraries. Um, oh, great. Um, some of you have read it. Um, but, you know, I think it, it really talks about, um, you know, emerging areas for librarians, um, how we can prove our value, um, show our value, demonstrate our value. Um, and some of the, the soft skills, um, like marketing yourself, um, like doing analysis, um, doing synthesis, um, that we may traditionally shy away from, um, but we really need to do, I think, moving forward. Um, so I'd encourage you to read that. It's a pretty readable report. It's not like, you know, sitting down with a scholarly article. It's, you know, presented to be easy to digest and go through. Um, so with that, I will just share my uh, contact information. Um, and um, so I'm happy to take any uh, questions or listen to any comments you have now. Um, and you're certainly most welcome to contact me uh, after the after the presentation um, anytime you want to ask a question or to chat. Um, love talking to students and uh, would love to hear more about what you all are doing and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tara. This was a great talk and really informative. I'm going to um, open a, um, the floor for questions, but I have wanted to start one. Is, um, would you recommend generally that students should look at unusual places for to apply for jobs? Um, I know that the SLA has this new site, but um, what are sort of, um, if you have heard of any strange places that people have looked looked at and found a fantastic list job? If you could share with us, that would be great. But if you could just talk about it. Uh, uh -huh. That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, beyond the, the job boards, um, I, I think the only job that I've gotten um, through a traditional library job board posting is actually my current job um, because I saw, you know, I knew about it ahead of time, but I saw it on an ALA uh, employment list. Um, but I would say talking talking to people, um, getting out there and going to events um, is really important. Um, that's that's a lot of what opened to my, my eyes to where some of the opportunities are. Um, you know, look at um, local employment listings. Um, you know, for example, in my area, if I were looking, um, I would look at Penn State and not just at the jobs posted by the library, um, but look at the general jobs, um, look at the job titles and, you know, think about where information skills could be applied. Um, I know a lot of people with uh, library degrees who are working, um, you know, as programmers um, in the Office for Research Protections um, in uh, grants offices, um, in, uh, you know, working with donors and prospect research. Um, so, you know, in, you know, in addition to looking at those library job boards, I would look at more general uh, job sites as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, yeah, and um, other organizations besides SLA, too. Thank you for mentioning that, Karen. Um, she mentions AA, double L. Um, but there, there are lots of other, um, you know, smaller specialized library organizations. Hi, 
I have a question um, going back to your management um, skills um, class that you took. I'm wondering, now that you've had various experiences on the ground and you took some classes as well, if you found the class to be worthwhile compared to um, for someone who hasn't had management experience. Yes, um, I do find it helpful. Um, you know, some of you may be coming to this as a second um, second career, and so maybe you already have some management or supervisory experience. Um, and I really don't think there's any class that could be as helpful as having actually done it. Um, but I, I do think the class really helped me. Um, you know, we had to do things like write a grant proposal, um, and we were encouraged to find an actual um, Grant and library, you know, so we were, you know, doing something that could potentially be funded um, rather than just doing it as a theoretical exercise. Um, we went through preparing budgets, um, which that really helped me when I got the public library job um, and was immediately thrown into having to pre prepare a budget for a, uh, a summer reading program. Um, so it really helps that I had done it as a class exercise. Um, and it helped to talk about, um, again, there's no uh, substitute for the real life experience, um, but you know, talking about um, different situations that you get into as a supervisor, um, you know, with students, with volunteers, um, with supervising other librarians, um, that's all been really helpful to me. Um, and I, I also took a class um, with the head of the library system at Pitt. Um, and he actually taught that in the library. Um, but th that was really great to have a class taught by somebody um, who's still working in the field. Um, so, you know, it, it was nice to have, you know, a lot of those working librarians who were adjunct professors and taught classes. Um, that was really helpful because they could talk about what they were actually doing in their job um, and, it, you know, invite us into the library and show us some real world situations. Kira, one of the things that you um, promoted through the talk I noticed was participation in professional organizations. And this is something that, of course, we try to promote. We try to convince students to join in, um, well, primarily we're talking, of course, about our um, student group, but in student groups in general that we have here on campus and get sort of um, get involved with them, not just become members, but also participate as much as possible, you know, realizing that many of our students work full time, go to school, have families, and so on. But, um, you know, the experience for those of us who are involved in the groups is that it's a great opportunity to network, um, right, you know, even before you sort of launched your career. So I was wondering, if you had any things that you wanted to add to it or any thoughts on that topic, and um, were you um, active in student groups when you were a student, or is that something you wish you had done? If you could talk about it a little bit, that would be great. Sure. Um, yeah, I actually, as I mentioned, had to be kind of prodded into joining uh, student groups when I was in library school. Um, you know, as I'm sure many of you are, I was working full time and taking classes in the evening. Um, and I was very busy, um, and so I, I wasn't really interested in getting involved in, you know, anything that I didn't really have to do. Um, and, you know, back then we couldn't do nearly as much virtually, so, you know, a lot of it was driving into the city and attending things in addition to the classes and the group work and, you know, the going into the library. Um, so it felt like a lot, but I'm really grateful that, uh, th that Dr. Allman pushed me to do that, um, that I was able to attend uh, an ALA conference when I was a student, that I was involved in the, in the SLA group. Um, yeah, I, I wish we'd been able to do more online when I was in school. That would have made it a lot easier. Um, but but um, Although online sometimes makes making connections a little more difficult. So I am really excited to see um, that you all are trying out this um, post-talk chat. Um, and I, I hope that works out well, because I think that's one of the things that you often miss in, in these online sessions is that um, 
you know, the kind of mingling and casual conversations that can often um, lead to jobs or projects or friendships or, you know, that's really important. Yeah, we find, I think, um, if I can speak for myself, but I think with this group specifically because we have a, um, our, a pretty tight-knit group here with the SLA is that it's a great way to make friends and also help each other out, both in school and professionally. Absolutely, and and it can be done online. I remember, um, you know, the the friend who helped me get my job at Penn State. I mentioned that she got her library degree online, and you know, I was in the office next to her, and you know, she did a lot of her a lot of the classes um, in the office, so I got to see um, and listen. And it seemed like she actually had closer relationships um, with her fellow students in the online program than I ever had when I was attending library school in person. Um, so it certainly can be done, um, and it, it seems like you all are doing a great job with that. Um, so kudos to you, and kudos to the faculty who work with you. Well, thank you. And in a sort of a funny story about networking, um, it turns out that we were um, tweeting somewhat improperly here, but um, one of our group friends, another um, SLA person, um, Tracy Maleef, is <laughs> spotted our um, tweet and um, on the fly gave, gave us some advice on how to tweet properly. So this oh. is a perfect <laughs> example of, um, um, you know, something that can be a, sort of done online. I had never personally met, met Tracy, but we consider her a friend of the group and um, she's watching us, watching out for us even when she's not participating. <laughs> I, I do know Tracy and she's great with social media. Um, she's done a lot for SLA with social media. And I just got to meet her at the Internet Librarian. Um, it's 7 o'clock, so I just wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight. And you're welcome to stay, and we can still have more questions and discussion and get to know each other. But I just wanted to make sure that um, if you have to leave, it's 7 o'clock, and I wanted to make sure everybody knew how grateful we were that you were here. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. It was great talking to you. This was a great group. And thank you very much, Kara, for taking the time to do this and for the great information and the resources that you provided. Yeah, thank Here's you for inviting me. Chime in and say thank you. Great talk. Thanks. <laughs> it's really it's hard for me to believe that I actually enjoyed doing this now. I mean, like I said, I I was just so 